All right, well, I guess we'll uh, get started. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Grayson Varner. Um, I've been a sound designer and composer uh, in the video games for 17 years. Uh, and nice. <clears throat> nice. Uh, and uh, about 13 of those were at Gearbox Software working on the Borderlands series. Um, so I'm actually here um, at the convention as a uh, voice guest. Um, and because uh, I was the writer and the voice of the Psycho Bandit in those series, uh, the NPC, not the playable character. Uh, and uh, but I also directed all the music uh, for that series, and I've pretty much written music uh, or directed music on um, every title that I've ever worked on. Um, actually, that's a lie. My very first title, I did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Only ten. Minutes. Um, but yeah, I, my, my career started in, I think it was 2006, on the original Prey. Um, I was an unpaid intern, uh, and luckily I was useful enough to them that they ended up bringing me on full time. I was delivering pizzas for Domino's, teaching piano, working 45 days straight. I mean, they weren't making me do that, just to be clear. Um, I just had the, the energy to do it back then. And I was just so stoked to, to be like, wow, like, my first game, and also, like, not only was I following Game Informer about Prey before the uh, posting, hey, I'm looking for an intern, came up on this, like, this, just this forums of this organization called Gang, literally the first year it started, I think they're like 17, 18 years now going now, uh, but this is the first year, and so as a little, like, bright-eyed person in the suburb of Philadelphia, I was like, well, I always knew Philly was a wasteland as far as game development goes. <laughs> and yeah, other people could probably follow that line of jokes there as well. <laughs> no argument here. Um, but uh, so I jumped out there and that kind of started everything off. After that, I was at Volition working on Red Faction Guerrilla and did all the kind of the physics audio, uh, physics driven audio in that game, which was really interesting. It was one of the first games I'm aware of that had completely open destruction. So we had to solve for all sorts of interesting cases where you're in a room, but it might not be a room, or it might open on one side of a room, or it could just cease to be. Um, we had to solve for all of that. Um, also, we, that was one of my uh, favorite music systems I worked on, on that game, where we developed a kind of a node-based probability system where you can kind of go through like nodes of trees and we built this whole visual tool just as internal tech that you'd have like th these branches and then you'd have like light cones going to the show that if it got more intense you could go from here to here and um, it, it's obviously there's, that's too loose of a description for to have a clear mental picture but just to kind of give an example that this is one of the uh, kind of unique features of writing music for games is obviously it's all data driven uh, for the most part so you have to find a way to take audio, which is essentially frozen, like a frozen snapshot in time, you can scrub through it, but it's frozen. It's like an imprint uh, into a stone. Um, and then you have to find a way to make all these non-malleable uh, tracks and clips form together to be seamless with the player experience. Um, and so for me, uh, that just, I don't know, that was like crack. Like I was just like, oh, what, film? Why would I do that? This is so much more complicated and all this other stuff. Um, uh, and so, the uh, reason I'm stepping through this is that the guy who ended up, who hired me as an intern, called me while I was at Volition and said, hey, uh, I've been working as the audio director at this company in Texas called Gearbox. They're like, super cool and interesting here, and we've got this project going on I think that you'd be like super interested in, and I, because I enjoyed working with you so much, I wanted to call you. Uh, and it was like, I couldn't tell you how perfect the timing was and he ended up hiring me at Gearbox. Um, and so there's a kind of like, when I was a kid in high school, I met a like professional composer in Philly who was like the guy who did the, the like Pennsylvania lottery theme and, and stuff like that. <laughs> Pennsylvania lottery. Ah, uh, uh, someone knows it. Yay, Philly. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and he said to me, uh, every, almost every single person in media can trace all of their jobs back to the first person that gave them work. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool, but there's no way that could just be how it goes. And then, lo and behold, <laughs> 13 years into Gearbox later, that's exactly what happened to me. Um, so, outside of that, um, I would say that 
Uh, music uh, for video games, uh, one of the kind of unique things is uh, there's a lot more space for melody. Um, you can do a lot more interesting stuff. And like in film, uh, sometimes people are, I don't really like the saying, but sometimes people are, are fond of saying, music should be felt but not noticed, or music should be in the background, or, or something like that. I, I don't think that that's actually accurate in terms of the role and how you need to think as a composer in linear media. Um, but there's definitely, you definitely cannot be like, while characters are talking, or even when they're not talking, being like, cool, well, let me just take center stage now, check out this badass shit in my music, and like, then go back, you know? That's like, no, 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 that's not what they do. Um, and that's always what drew me to video games, is that video games, if you're not doing that, <laughs> saying here's something super interesting, you're kind of like not taking advantage of the medium for it. Uh, so that's, that's something that I think is always uh, useful uh, to kind of conceptualize what is different in kind of a stylistic or creative sense between games and film uh, is that if you're kind of into that, uh, that and you like the complexity of doing data-driven systems and having to kind of think in layers and think about possibilities and like, okay, the track could go a few different ways, um, games are really good um, for that. So I figure, just to kind of get a, a sense of the room, um, are, how many people do we have here who are interested or produce music in the background on their free time or, or want to do music for games? Oh wow, okay, awesome, there's a lot more. Okay, great. Um, so what I'll do is, um, and feel free, uh, the functional part of my brain over here, Seth. Uh, <laughs> uh, just yell at me when I'm 30 minutes in. And, uh, and I'll try to leave like 30 minutes open for Q&A, because um, uh, I wasn't able to have a presentation together uh, this year. Uh, so I want to make sure you guys all have a chance to kind of ask your questions and, and get any information uh, you guys would like. Um, I need to head back to the, the table, the signing table after this, but if anyone wants to kind of follow me down there um, to continue a conversation, that's also work. Um, so what I'll uh, talk a little bit about is, uh, so, like. Uh, there's a few, I'd say there's kind of three things with game music that uh, you want to think about. Uh, one is production, right, and production quality. And like really the only people that actually have an opportunity to have someone else mix their music, to have someone else record the music, because uh, in film, that is the advantage of film. The advantage of film is that it's so specialized that you get all of these artists together, it's, it's, you're going to mostly have live instrumentation unless it's like TV or something. But even then, it's much more frequent that you're going to be working with live musicians and being able to take advantage of having all those kind of brains just, just really focusing on their, each individual part. For video games, you're going to need to be the one doing all of that. And so you need to learn how to uh, produce, uh, uh, sorry, have uh, high production quality. You may need to learn multiple styles, so you may need to become comfortable with electronic production, um, just as comfortable as, with, as you might be with full, or, or, uh, sorry, full orchestral uh, composition as well. Uh, and they all have their different um, uh, bodies of knowledge and methods that you need to kind of incorporate. Uh, and that's something I've always enjoyed. So obviously not as relevant for the Borderlands series. Uh, one of the ironies that I actually made background was orchestral not EDM. So when I started on Borderlands, and if anyone goes back and listens to Borderlands 1 tr tracks with electronic influence and then listen to Borderlands 3 tracks with electronic influence, like, yeah, you're going to hear like my crusty, I'm just learning EDM over here, be one, <laughs> and then, oh, that actually sounds more professional. Uh, and that was because when I started on uh, Borderlands, uh, I had just been starting to like learn um, and there's a time, this is when like Dead Mouse was just, you know, getting big. This is when dubstep was still fresh and cool. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, before it became its own meme. Um, and, uh, and so that informed a lot of the style of Borderlands 1. Because we started off, we had kind of this world music element uh, to everything. And then I kind of like, was like, okay, in order for us to kind of be on the cutting edge of, you know, what's popular and everything, because at the time, back then, now, now having this kind of like EDM cross influences, this is like everywhere, that hybrid sound. But back in the time, that's in 2007, like that wasn't, that wasn't as frequent. So that was something that 
Um, and Borderlands, one of the things that we always did was, uh, yes, we're going to have this world elements in music, and the world elements and the ethnic instrumentation is there to help enhance the alienness of the world and just make it feel a little different, less familiar. Um, and then, but because of the attitude and the tone shift that we had about, I don't know, six, seven months before release, um, because we were a little more like photorealistic and serious. And then as we sort of kind of, as a team started to be like, oh, what feels right? Once we started shifting to kind of the more ridiculous and bracing that, and then we switched over to that kind of illustrated look. Um, uh, it just really played into that direction. And I was lucky too, because I was like, oh my God, we completely changed the visual style. And I was like, if this music isn't working anymore, we're gonna have like two hours that needs to be rewritten, like reorders. And so in the very first like test level we put together, you know, we had music uh, clips in there, or, or the music system was working, so we had the music implemented, and it was like, oh, it still works. It might even be working better now. And so we're like, yeah, yay! And so we needed, uh, and then something is like, we wanted the music, ambient music is, isn't wallpaper. It's there to help connect with you emotionally. I think that's one of the reasons, uh, like Jesper's track for Firestone, um, I think that's, that's what that's just become like iconic for a lot of people. Uh, and it's because it had a resonance with the environment. And so part of that was, you know, twang mixed with ethnic instrumentation and then aggressive EDM when the, the fighting starts. Because that kind of like uh, beats the frag to was sort of a shorthand I would use around the office. And, uh, and it was just kind of a unique energy. Uh, and then the other part of that is it's one of the first, uh, it's the first time I ever worked on a system where I wanted to abstract out via data the amount of challenge that you were encountering. Because at the time, so it was like, you know, like, it was like a, kind of like a Skyrim meme. Combat music starts, so let me look around and like, there's a bear three hills over up shore, he's coming. And, and at the time, that was sort of like the, the binary on and off. If you just tied yourself to combat state, you get in all sorts of weirdness like that. Because the literalness of the data in the game is often you need something in between. Here's the data readout, and now here's how I'm gonna smooth out the data that we're getting from the game, so the performance of the music and the way we trigger things are now they're feeling kind of like in flow with everything. So um, one of the my ideas for that game was, in, if we need to separate us from just that binary state, I want to try to collect data. And so we had a concept called threat. So I'd go through the whole game and open every single configuration file for every single creature in the game, and I would say, okay, baby skags, you're worth like 0.25. Um, this badass version, you're worth 1.5 points. And so what we'd also do is say, okay, here's your delta level, and then based on, it's more of like an experiential feel, there's, there's no real like mathematical equation you can do for this, but you know, I would play through the game and say, okay, when there's four skag pups and two adult skags, and I'm equal level, I'm actually being pressed. Like I actually need to focus. And so, okay, so what was that point value so we would create these thresholds so that it wasn't just, because you, you could come back to that area, but if you're five levels or, uh, overpowered, you're just like, this is a breeze, I'm just mowing things down. It's like, okay, don't play combat music. Uh, and the reason we do that is it's sort of like, it's this implicit messaging to the player that yes, we understand, or the game understands that you're OP, and you're not really challenged. And, what, and the reason I wanted to make sure that that happened was that when you get back to the point of the game where you are challenged, all of a sudden that music, and you're like, wow, the game just feels more intense. Uh, and, and remember, because it's, it's uh, something that's always a uh, tension with uh, designers, uh, it, often I'm like, just about, it doesn't matter what company I've been at or anything, is the designers are very, very literal often in how they're thinking about it. And they're thinking, well, if I have this state, then I should have this response or this feedback. And so here's the state, and we should have this response and this feedback. And at first, they were kind of uncomfortable. Like, you know, I keep getting into combat. I'm not really hearing music that much. And so I would have discussions with them. And I said, so my goal here is that sort of like the, the hook in a popular song is usually in the middle for a reason. Uh, and the reason it's there is that you have to get through some of the song to hit that hook. But if they hit you with the hook right up at the start, you're satiated. Uh, but the hook needs to be part of satiating you later in the track. And that's what keeps bringing you back. And so I would always tell them that I want you to feel like, like the, the sweet spot is to feel like we're just not quite playing it enough. 
And again, not never, but just enough that you're like, I wish I just heard it just a little bit more. And then we're probably gonna be in a, a nice kind of sweet spot. And that helped kind of commu communicate with them and help them sort an expectation in their head as well. So it took a lot of like kind of the nervousness away. Um, and then we shipped with that and then they were totally on board. Um, and one of my favorite things that during uh, Borderlands 1, um, I had put the, so I, had, I, had, I was doing the music for Skag Valley, uh, which is one of the uh, kind of early areas in the game. And in order so I, to follow in that rule of having ethnic instrumentation, uh, I put in like Mongolian throat singing. And uh, one of the coders, who was, uh, he was working on audio code, but he's also doing like other uh, DLC features and stuff like that, they just thought it was hilarious. So every time I walked by the room, they'd moo at me because they said it sounded like a cat. <laughs> And it was like a moo, moo, you know, type of type of sound in there. So I'd walk by and they and be like moo, <laughs> and that just I was like, oh, it's real love. I feel loved <laughs> and seen. Um, and and that kind of spirit is, you know, that's really that's what went into the Borderlands games, and and that's why the Borderlands games feel the way that they feel. Is you know, uh, and that's the, that was my favorite thing of working the IP, no matter what Borderlands, no matter what DLC, it's, it should feel like you guys are in on the joke and we're sort of like, you're having fun like the devs had fun or experienced joy while building. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, professionally, that's always something I try to uh, cultivate. Um, uh, and I guess I'll veer into just VO a little bit to kind of expand upon that point. Um, and in BL1, uh, I was directing all the voice actors. And I'm not a dialogue director. They're like much better actors who are much better at that. But at the time, you know, we, we were about, I think we were like 90 people. So we all had to wear a lot of hats. Uh, and um, I told everyone, and this has become my, kind of my standard if I'm onboarding a new, com new composer uh, to the series or something. I'm, it takes a little while because different companies have different cultures. And the safest expectation as a freelancer is to be like, okay, they want serious professionalism, and so let me, you know, oh, so in this high-minded concept, and here's, here's what I want to do the music. And I just start out with them, I'd be like, look, we're here to have competent fun. If we're not having fun, especially in this series, then we're probably not doing our best work. Uh, and same with the voice, voice artists who were, who were performing on the game. I said, hey, we're here to have competent fun, so we're all professionals, we're good at what we do, but we're also not going to take ourselves too seriously. And we're just going to put our heads 100% into what we're doing. And I also made sure that, like, one of the things that really, at least on BL1, that I felt brought a lot of the charm is that every voice actor I worked with, I said, no, we're going to riff on this. We're going to, if you have an idea, just run with it. And then we'll discuss if we need to. Um, so that the, each actor that was in the booth could also kind of make the roles theirs a little bit. And when someone has a little bit of that sense of ownership and they feel like they're part and they feel like they actually have a voice in the creativity of, of the, the role, the character, uh, the task, you know, whatever it is and whatever discipline it happens to be, they, they just, they enjoy it so much and they, they get inside of it and you just get this wonderful performance out of them. Uh, and that's something that like, I, uh, yes, one of my favorite uh, memories actually is, um, I can't remember his name right now off the top of my head, one of the mini bosses, but one of his lines that were not written by any writer, he just belted it out in the studio in the middle of a pain exertion, was, the burning lets you know it's working! Oh. And I was like, wait, hold up, pause, I gotta add that line to, uh, to our script, because we're shipping that. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and as uh, voice actors came out of the studio, like, most of them came out and would say, like, that was one of the most enjoyable sessions I've had in my career, or one of the most enjoyable sessions I've had in the last three years, five years, whatever. Um, and, and so that's something that um, I feel like video games have more space for that sort of interaction and to have that kind of spirit. Um, and you gotta find the right studios to do that because not all projects are, are actually appropriate necessarily to have that. You know, The Last of Us, like, oh, we're, the, we're just joking around here. But like, mm, no, no, that's yeah. not, that would not work for that, uh, for that game. Um, uh, so yeah, so I'd say at, at a high level, you've got that, you've got the data systems, uh, and then you have that kind of, um, I don't know, like, like just integrating your kind of joy into the things, 
there's something about that that just lends itself to games. Uh, and so if you're interested in writing music for games, because I'm not going to pretend that I, you know, I'm a linear media composer. Uh, it's not where the bulk of my experience lies. Uh, but that's something about games that you can then bring in the data. So if you have that same, same kind of analytical mind that gets really satiated by that, that's great. Um, how are we on time? 22. 6.2. Okay. Uh, so talking about data systems, um, and hopefully this is not dry, but I figure I'll, I'll touch on it. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about this. Um, sometimes we call them train car approaches, which think of music clips that are linked together, almost like it's a bunch of boxcars on a train. Um, and uh, as you go through them, maybe it's a probability web, maybe it's just sequencing, maybe it's just hard track switching, but you can either go clip to clip to clip and just have like stereo clips. And the nice thing is that that's relatively simplistic to uh, conceptualize in your head. It's easier to manage uh, and your production's a lot simpler. Now the other aspect is you can go to a stem-based approach. And you can go to all sorts of like, how well do you want to do a basic stem mixing? Or are you going to have stem mixing plus clips, plus transitions, and just get exponentially more complicated? Uh, and so you have to consider like, okay, what are my resources? What's the system that I want to develop? Like, how, what's my budget for composers? Um, or if I'm internal, like what, how many hours do I have to spend to this? How many other jobs am I doing right now that I need to uh, think about? Um, and the nice thing is, if you're just doing clips and stereo clips, then you can just export everything out as if it's your final master product. And you just, boom, okay, just slot them in, just slot them in, slot them in. Um, so Borderlands 1, that's what BL1 was. We had a system that abstracted out threats so that hopefully we were uh, disassociating the music from just raw state changes. And that's kind of like your first. So that, that, that's basically, that would be an example where the actual music construction was, sim was simplistic, but we tried to be more interesting with the data so the triggering of when the music would play would feel bad. Uh, then on the other side of that, you can start to really complexify and start creating layers on the music side and the production side. Uh, and then you just need to account for it. So say, so for example, I was working on a title, uh, it was orchestral music um, uh, years ago, and uh, I, we were doing this layered approach, and I had like 12 steps that I had to, to mix on the fly. And so, okay, all 12 stems need to play against each other and play at the same time, and that needs to be not overwhelming, but it also needs to sound full. But also, we need to come down to one out of 12 stems, and that needs to feel like it's doing a job as well. It can't feel like it's silence, but it also, you know, can't, can't be overly developed, or otherwise you'll have no range to move through. And so when you start getting into multi-layered systems, now you have to say, okay, how do we determine in the game when it should be the full mix, and when should it break down? And if we just do it randomly, and it's not connected to context in the game, then people aren't gonna feel as connected to it. Uh, so how do you go about that? Because it's very easy to be seduced by complexity as when you're, when you're really into these systems. Because, uh, you know, it's uh, often that's, oh, we can do this and this and the system do this, and it's so flexible, it can do all these other things. And, uh, and that's kind of a danger in development is you can kind of be seduced by the complexity and how exciting the complexity is. And then you get into a time crunch and you go, oh my god, why did we go so complex? This is a huge mistake. And, uh, and that's kind of like a, I don't know, I feel like it's a meme within, the, within development. So, so uh, you really get to explore this stuff. And so that kind of culminated in Borderlands 3. Um, and by the way, if anyone's interested, um, I actually have done like a shorter version of a, a Game Time Con conference talk I gave on the music system, the music style of Borderlands 3. If anyone goes to my website, which is just racingvarner.com, uh, or just Google my name, it, sh it should be one of the results that come up. Uh, you can actually go and watch those presentations in much more detail, and they have video examples as well. Um, so if you ever want to check that out after the talk, then you can, it'll help you internalize so it's not just me talking at you. Uh, but what we started doing in that series, uh, or I'm sorry, that installment of the series, is we had this concept of threat that we continued on, and we added a new concept called interest. Uh, interest, you can think of it like an XY coordinate system. 
So the interest would drive the stem mix and how dense the arrangement was. And so that was when we decided, hey, we're going to come up with this abstract concept called interest. That interest is going to drive how many layers are playing, and threat is going to drive how intense the music is. Uh, and so we immediately, that immediately, it's an exponential increase. It's not like, oh, we just need more stereo tracks. It's no, now we need like, no, we do four to eight bar phrases. We're gonna need like 19 of them, plus each phrase needs to have five layers. And each one of those layers needs to also have random options. So you might have one like four, eight bar piece of music, but it's got, maybe there's, uh, I think, uh, five, seven, I think we had seven. <laughs> got it. Uh, <laughs> That's what you're supposed to say. You're breathtaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we had like seven layers, and uh, some of those layers, so that they could, they're just cycling through. Then you need some options. So say you uh, you have your melodic layer. Well, here's one melody. Here's another melody you can play. Here's a third melody you can play, and then you get that randomization. And so you get this hierarchy. Kind of if I went bottom up, is uh, I'll just say violins, just, just to simplify this a little bit. The violins, right? And then the violins could be these three different melodies. And then that steps up into, oh, and this container is part of this intensity. So um, let me take another step back, because I realize that this is, this is, this is just going to be opaque. Uh, <laughs> so uh, step back, stepping back, we basically we would have this, think of our categories from here to here. And we split it up, saying, here's your level one intensity. Here's your level two, and here's your level three. And each one of those levels, you have collections of, we'll say, like uh, containers of music. And each one of those containers might be four or eight bars long, um, but then inside each one of those containers is the seven layers. And then inside the seven layers below that, some of those tracks have variations and options that, that could then cycle. And so it was called a section, and then these containers were called parts. And so Parts would randomly cycle within a section while you were in that. The interest level is saying how many of these layers are playing within these parts. And what would happen is the interest level was on an oscillator inside the game, so it would just naturally get more complex and break down. And then we had things that would I call that given the, the system a kick. Um, and for any use, it's like an uh, ADSR for any of those uh, any synth nerds out there. Um, but essentially, what would happen is we would kick the interest up when you got like a zone discovery. Because that means you just entered a new area. And so if you're ever playing BL3 and you start paying attention to that, every time you get one of these you know, new area open, what will happen is a second or two seconds after that, you'll, you'll feel the music kind of swell up for a little while. And then it'll come back down. And it's like we give it a little kick, and then it, it always has a decay rate that's just always bringing it back down. Um, and likewise, when you're in combat, uh, when you enter combat, we also give the system a kick. And then the longer combat lasts, the more we decay the layers down and down and down. And we also had filters that would also follow that. So the filter would follow the interest level. So as the interest level comes down, because if you've been in combat for five minutes, and it's been like, bah, 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 you know, like, you're like, okay, you know, I got it. So it would kind of start going, bah, 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 bah. And it kind of come down, the low pass filter would come in, kind of get muffled. So the longer you were in combat, you know, the less busy the music got. And then it got out of the way of the high frequency of the weapons as well. So there's also a mixing technique for the game. Uh, but if you had a surge of enemies come back in, we would detect that and say, oh, we have this big delta in our threat all of a sudden. Okay, give it a kick. And then the arrangement comes up, the filter opens up, and it like matches with your experience. And then same thing. So it's coming down. And the nice thing about that is that also the longer that the music is decaying down and hitting this kind of resting state, the longer that combat, the smoother the exit is when you go back to ambience. And so those are, those are kind of, I guess, uh, Borderlands examples um, to kind of, I just wanted to try to outline some of the like simplest to most complex um, and try to just hit some of the kind of thematic notes um, of why I think scoring for games is special. Um, so from here on out, I wanted to open it up for Q&A. Um, uh, we doesn't look like we have a mic for questions, so just belt it. If uh, anyone, if anyone would just like to raise their hands, and I'll just pick totally random. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so one one thing I noticed is that uh, for a lot of artists, they'll sometimes self-impose certain restrictions on themselves while they're working on uh, things so that they can kind of experiment more and be a little more creative with it. Uh, were there any moments whenever you were making the score that you had put some type of restriction on yourself, which then gave you more ideas to something that you didn't know you could do? Yeah, um, the question is about imposing restrictions on yourself to enhance the creativity of your work. Um, and yes, absolutely. Um, uh, one of the style guide rules for Borderlands uh, for all the composers would be is to say, hey, every, every, every piece that we write needs to be about 70% of a song structure, 40 or 30%, I know the math doesn't, but like somewhere between that 60, 40, 70, 30 split between being score and more the song. Uh, and that gives us a stylistic edge. The other thing is, you can use brass, but it needs to be textural. And then, sorry. Brass can never be a leading line. So if you can have French horns in there, but they gotta be going or like doing some kind of like flutter thing or something. They need to be used as a texture, because nothing would pull us out of our kind of zone of the style more than like, ba -ba -ba, you know, you have this leading brass line or some screaming trombones or something like that. And it might sound super cool in the music, but that's where you start to, you know, you need that restriction in place because that, that restriction is part of what gives you the, the style, the personality, and the identity. Right. Um, and the nice thing is that actually extends to tool work also. So, not even about music. Um, it's just a bad analogy. I think it's a bad analogy. But I call it the, the problem of the wrench hammer. Uh, and really what it is is like, if you had a hammer that was like a hammer on one end and a wrench on the other, it's a very flexible tool. I can do all sorts of things with it. But if you have a hammer and a wrench, you're probably never gonna actually reach for that wrench hammer. Because while it, it does great, oh, that's awkward, the weight's weird, and it just feels better to use the hammer, because the hammer's purpose has been built just to do that thing. And so, that kind of speaks towards that, you know, seduction of complexity and, and whatnot. Is that I always tell people, you wanna think about how you're engineering your systems like a, the way an engineer designs a car not the way that we might design complexity uh, like analytic systems or something along those lines. Um, and because the, what car um, engineers are always trying to do and dealers are, they're trying to remove as many parts from the car as possible. Because every single part you add to the car is a new point of failure that can diminish the profitability of the company and increase the service costs. Um, and that's exactly the kind of mindset you want to have when you're designing tools or building systems simple as possible and the other nice thing is when you choose your limitations you also can predict say I know that two years from now this is a limitation we're going to be dealing with and so it also helps focus your mind on the problems and say no 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 we can't do that because we already accepted this limitation and it also helps because what happens a lot in development is like oh it doesn't feel right could it be this it could be, be this system could this be the problem is it the health of the monsters are we just bullet sponges and that's not making it fun and like and it really when you're just abstractly trying to think about this stuff you're like ah what direction like what's right and that's where like putting those limitations on yourself helps kind of collapse the amount of possibilities you have to consider um, and it, it's helpful uh, questions uh, back here with the uh, black show. Um, so you mentioned how you had all of these different parts that you could like build on top of each other so you make sure that like really small enemies aren't too drastic or anything like that. But when you have an event that's really impactful or like the big bad or something like that, how do you ensure that they're like, how do you find that ceiling? Do you work backwards? Have you had to adjust to smaller enemies? How do you ensure that that's like the player register this is the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, the, the question is about how, if you're in a system, how do you determine when you need to break out of that system um, and play maybe like a, you know, a, a linear piece or something, um, if, if I understood the question. Um, and uh, at least for the formula of Borderlands, the way Borderlands played, it was pretty easy. It was either cutscene or boss battle. Um, because in Borderlands, there really was no reason unless, I mean, we'll phase up the music sometimes, where like phase one, phase two, phase three, and then like you have a track that loops on each of those. Um, but there wasn't a whole lot, and so in, in, at least in Borderlands 3, we had this huge complex system doing all this cool stuff. Um, we also were decided that like, yeah, but the boss battles are a boss battle, and the boss battles should just be feel like Borderlands, and that just needs to be a badass track. 
Um, and so for Borderlands, it was, it was pretty easy because we didn't really deliver heavy narrative moments in gameplay. Those heavy narrative moments were all, almost always cutscenes. Uh, so Borderlands was pretty easy. It was like all gameplay is all systemic except for bosses and cutscenes. And so that's, that, that was the easy part. Other times in other games, you'll, you'll find ways to say, oh, here are the cues, here's where we need to build around. Um, and that's one of the things that's kind of fun, because project to project, you can be informed by your previous systems, but you're not necessarily going to reproduce them. Uh, if that answered the question. Um, yes, here in front. If you had to throw out all of the tools like you already know how to use and rebuild that scope of knowledge from the beginning, where would you start, and kind of what path would you take for relearning everything? Okay, uh, the question is if I had to throw everything out and start fresh, where would I start? Um, and let me, let me know if this answers your question, but because uh, uh, I don't know if it'll be satisfying. <laughs> but I would start back pretty much where I was in Borderlands 1, where, okay, simplify the music production so that I can focus more on the system. Because it's the triggering of the music that's more important than how complex the music is. Um, an, an example of that would be. We have much better generative music systems now than we did, say, in 2007. But um, oftentimes, and this was kind of a personal, like, negative bias of my own during that during that period, was, oh, if it's generative, then it, it probably doesn't really feel like emotional at all. It probably just feels like boops and beeps and tinks and whatever and bells that come in. And and so and that would be an example because there'd be a lot of titles that I'd be listening to, and I'd be like. That is a super complex, super cool generative system. It's very intellectually interesting, but I don't feel anything. And at the end of the day, that again, it's that like, is the audience playing with B in the game and are they part of the part of the, the play and part of the back and forth? And if they're not feeling anything from the music, then no matter how awesome it is and how technical of a content accomplishment it is, we're missing the mark in our ultimate purpose of having the music being present in the first place. And so that's where I would always come back to is simplify my production and try to get the triggering to be more intelligent. Because the once that logic is working, those sort of the, the complexities of what you need to address in the game will then inform how are you going to write. Um, and that's also something I would say I think the industry is understanding a little better these days, but that a lot of the times freelance composers get hired on and they're like, hey, here's the system, so here's your limitations, here's the box you have to work within, and make it cool. Um, and I think that, uh, at least in my opinion, I think that people are a little, becoming a little disconnected from the process because it should be a little bit more like a handshake, where your system influences how you write, how your writing influences your system. And if you have this sort of, if you keep, keep the two concepts in tension with one another, then you're going to be much closer to the mark. Your, the, your ability to write interesting stuff is going to be eased because you, you've, you've kind of chosen the limitations that make sense for the instrumentation, the style, whatever other like creative guidelines you might have. So I hope oh, that, that answer. Um, over here, the head. So, uh, the badass head. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, so, whenever you first started out, uh, how bad was development crunch and um, has it gotten worse over time with the amount of complexities in modern games? And how does development crunch affect you as a sound designer compared to, I guess, like other roles? Yeah, we're, as sound designers, we're fond of saying that we're at the ass end of the pipe. Um, <laughs> it all flows down pipe. <laughs> uh, but we're also, because of that, and I kind of joke, well, because we also need survival instincts, we also tend to be the canaries in the coal mines. Uh, and that's usually how I try to work with producers on that to say, look, we have this concern, but like, it's not specifically audio. It's more that, hey, this is serving as a heuristic. Because we have to think about these things all the time, because we know everything's going to get finished to a point where we can. Because oftentimes, we legitimately can't support it early. Because we just don't have enough information about how it triggers, how frequently, other logic. And it may not even have like VFX or the right colors on it or anything like that. So if we invested a ton of work too early, then in the grand scheme of the, the schedule and the project, well, we just wasted all this time. Um, and you need to iterate, but there's a point in the project where your iteration is now cost, and you're losing time. Um, I would say early on, um, 
Crunch was bad, but a lot of it was more because we just didn't have enough people. Uh, and nowadays, I would say, uh, I, don't, I don't really think they even have Crunch anymore. Um, at Gearbox, from, from what I hear. It's been a few years since I was uh, at Gearbox internally. Um, but all my friends that are still over there, that's kind of what I've heard. Even since I left, it's like even got better. Um, oftentimes what I find is that um, crunch happens because we waited too long to make a decision. Um, or we didn't pre-plan on the cuts. Um, and that's something I think is always important. No matter what the discipline happens to be, it's, that's, a, that's a way of knowing, like the best way to avoid crunch, well, one is have a large staff. Like miraculously, crunch seems to disappear once you reach a team of 12 people. Um, Borderlands 1 was a team of one and a half. So um, Borderlands 2 was like three and a half. Um, Borderlands 3, I think we hit 11, 12 by the end of it. Um, and that's why we were able to do so much more and, and kind of keep it under control. And I would say crunch wasn't too bad uh, for us on, on BL3. It was there, uh, but oftentimes, um, I think oftentimes it's a misnomer. Uh, in, uh, it's almost a misnaming to call it crunch. Because um, really what it is, is uh, a burnout, it is really. And crunch is actually just a, one small component of the facet, facets of components that lead to burnout. And it's actually not even the most severe. Um, but the reason it's so difficult to, to manage that within the games industry, because, you know, most managers are well-intentioned. Most managers don't actually want to see that. It's just like everyone's trying to navigate through the fog and can't figure out how to defog the environment. Uh, and so it's all these, these things come from multiple uh, directions, actually. But one of the biggest things that causes burnout is actually more narrative-based. Uh, meaning like the story that you attach to your own experience within the company. And so for example, in a company that has professed values, but the culture departs from those professed values, is a much greater contributor to burnout than just the hours you worked. Because the hours that you worked are all kind of relational to the person. Um, because I could work a f uh, like a 50 hour week and feel totally energized and satisfied at the end of that week uh, and be really happy. I could work a 25 hour week that was full of just soul crushing work that I didn't want to do or attention, and now I'm burnt out. But I worked half time. Uh, and so a lot of it is, it's really when it, a lot of it comes down, it's that loss of agency that really kind of drives people into that hole. Um, because there's like this whole sliding scale from being engaged with your work, to being disengaged with your work, to being um, cynical about the work in the company, and then you become embittered. And, and you, they're almost like stages of grief in a way, but this is like the stages of burnout and collapse. Uh, and that's something that, um, if you, if, for me personally, this is my own theory, by the way, <laughs> informed by real science and people that know this stuff better. But the way I relate it to games is, once you start to get to cynicism and, and bitterness, it's you almost can't come back. And so that's usually the, the lens that I use. Uh, so if I'm a manager, that's what I'm looking for in my people. It's like, oh, are they starting, am I noticing that they're getting really cynical? Then like, okay, let's, let's have a kind of a, a sidebar or one-on-one, -on -one. let's talk about what's happening. That could be life events, it could be other things. And oftentimes what happens at some point in the conversation, it's like, I don't feel like I can, I can own my things and I feel like I get punished even when I do the right thing. And, that sort of like, so what am I supposed to do? I don't have any agency here. That's actually like kind of the demon um, kind of things. So hopefully that answers the question, possibly. Um, over here in the third, fourth row. Oh, um, so what was um, one of the uh, tracks or songs that you uh, worked on that it just felt like you were running into a brick wall, like you couldn't uh. figure it out? <laughs> took a lot of time to develop it or something or something? Um, the, uh, uh, General Trant, his boss music and, and Necrofeo. That, I even actually I have it up on my SoundCloud, I have every version. <laughs> uh, and it was like version 6 where I, I finally landed on. But you can even hear like, you go through and you're like, oh that's super cool, but yeah the tone was like off. 
And that's like the worst one. That's like the worst the iteration cycle to get into. Oh my god, this is badass. Uh, this doesn't really fit. Uh, just seduce myself with my own badassitude again, but it doesn't fit. So, oh yeah, what a badass. Uh, you know. Um, and because uh, that's also a, a side thing as a composer and creative, you have to like learn how to like ignore your own voice when it starts doing that stuff. Uh, but I would say that's actually one where um, I really like. I was like, why can't I get this right? Uh, and then it's cool because then you see all these comments on SoundCloud or other places of like, dude, the general Trump track. Oh, I love this. Uh, and then it, you know, you sort of like you can kind of uh, distance yourself from that that process of frustration. Just kind of embrace it as part of the process when it happens. Um, and then, you know, if you really need to and you're like, I don't even know, like, hey, contractor, <laughs> how would you like to write this music? And then the first try, they knock out of the park and you're like, oh, I'm just going to quiet that voice again. Yeah. <laughs> um, over here, you've been raising your hand. You're in the front row. Oh, you. yeah. Um, so I know, like, for me personally, I always struggle with melody, melody development. Um, you know, I think a lot of musicians struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Like they can play, like with the, if you give them something or learning off of a recording or something, but actually developing your own melody and harmonic structure, I think is really difficult. So when you're like working on a piece for, you know, a game, do you focus on the chords first or do you do melody and then apply chords to that? You know, it's all over the place. It really just depends on the thing I'm working on and what's important. Sometimes I start with the beat or the percussion. Sometimes I start with just the pad. Sometimes I start with a melody. Uh, sometimes I start with my voice. Not singing, just doing weird shit. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't sing, but I can do chanting and cool oh, stuff yeah. like that. Um, so yeah, it just it just kind of kind of just depends. Um, which is the most dissatisfying answer, <laughs> especially to producers. <laughs> I see. Um, so I have a lot of experience with music composition and writing music, but less so with like systems and implementation and things yes. like that and coding. Um, do you have any advice for like how to market myself for jobs or internships, or should I focus on developing those other skills first? So if it's specifically music, then you absolutely want to focus on implementation because one of the things is there are also things like music designer roles that will open up at like larger companies, um, and that's where you're just working on implementation. Um, so like WYs, that's what I've been, I've been WYs for like 17 years, WYs in Unreal, that's been what I've been doing the last, uh, yeah, all those years. Uh, and you want to be able to, the best demo you could show for interactive music, you have to show that interactive part. And so there might be like Unreal games, it is, it is really hard, it's kind of an uphill battle because it's not like when you're just working on your composition and production, then yeah, you can just, you can keep that in your own enclosed environment. You don't have to deal with scripting, you don't have to deal with things breaking, break, and like bashing your head against what the hell is going on, and oh, I spent four hours just to realize I left a zero off on my configuration file. Um, and that's all part of development, so kind of just getting into that. They, there are some projects, this is really, I don't even know how you access it anymore, I think it's still accessible, but there used to be a, um, um, oh my god, uh, not inside, if you guys are familiar with the game, oh man, I'm drawing a blank also, I know. But there's an old game that you could get with Y, W-Ys, um, and be able to actually connect and replace the wave files with your own work. So looking for projects like that, where they're already done, and you can you already have the scaffolding, um, that's that's really important. Um, and also, I want to return to your question, because I realized they did not answer your question about melodies, oh. <laughs> which is actually like probably the more important part. Um, Something that, that I've tried to teach melodic writing when I have composition students is to, uh, at least for me, I don't try to think of it as like mathematical relationships or technical things. Think of it as terms of direction and distance and jumping and like, you know, those distances. Um, because you're right whether you're going up, whether you're going down. If you think of the line as a direction and you can think of the cadence of the line as sort of speech in a way, you know, like, you know, you're going to have that more kind of uh, punctuated feel. Well, also think of it almost like you're drawing a curve of some kind. Um, because what a little help you do is like, yeah, you can do jumps in like Star Wars, the Star Wars theme, those like fifths or octave jumps all over the place. Um, and they're all there. So you can think of that, at least I, I think of it as distance, like how big of a jump. And then what are those steps in between the jump? 
and what is that, that kind of curve or that line that we're taking through the melody. And I think that helps write, helps you become a little more directed in your writing. Um, but it's a very loose concept. It's certainly not like a, a method. It's not a mechanical thing you could just put into practice. But I, for me, that really helped me uh, write melodies that felt better, that captured things a little bit more. Um, and then the other thing to think of it is, is how, um, how much information am I building for the use of a hold in their memory? Because the longer your phrase is, the longer the mem musical memory the user has to have in order for it to even be meaningful. So that's also something to consider. Because sometimes doing that kind of more through written where you don't repeat anything in the piece is actually like really good. Uh, but if you're trying to do a memorable me melody, that's the other thing is think of like, what's the time slice that I need to put in user memory? <laughs> yeah. uh, and then that can help give you like, oh, a window for me to kind of consider. Um, and hopefully that helps kind of break down the complexity of the world. Uh, is there anyone, I've uh, got a couple minutes left. Uh, you. Uh, so uh, I actually uh, ended up getting a degree in uh, music composition. Okay. And the thing that influenced me was actually video game music. That's awesome. Um, I wanted to know for you, what got you into this industry? Like, not, not so much like how did you get a job, but what influenced you? Uh, so the question is, what influenced me into becoming a composer for games? Um, and uh, Nobu Uematsu, honestly. <laughs> uh, I graduated high school in 1999. Um, and uh, actually, uh, there was a Sega CD game called Dark Wizard. And Dark Wizard was the very first game that had a live orchestral soundtrack against Genesis graphics. And if none of you have heard of this game, Dark Wizard Check out that orchestral sound. It, it is amazing. It really, it is incredible music. Uh, and it was awesome. It was like a Master of Monsters style game, but like with a hex, a hex map, and your monsters upgraded as you killed and game experience. And like, I don't know, I, that game was like, I love it. That, that's my job. But yeah, those two things definitely work out for you. Uh, and here. Okay. Um, will you wing Chung tonight? <laughs> I'm not cruel enough to know the answer to that. My particular dorkness is coming out. <laughs> I have failed the very last question of the night. No, no. Um, I think it's time for one more. Um, so to kind of elaborate on what you had said with uh, the Man, that's hard. That's totally another it depends answer. Um, but it's not a, and I say that because it's, it's not a formulaic answer to that. It really kind of depends on, because it's one of those things that's like, well, you could go either direction, and the main thing is you just got to embrace that direction. And, and so the real question is, if I embrace this direction, go hard, excuse me, go hard in that direction, how will that serve the game? How, how will that serve this moment? Because chances are, they both could serve it equally, but the preferences of the team might influence you to go one way or the other. The director of the project you might know has a very particular thing in mind, and that's gonna, that's gonna be what pushes you one direction or the other. So, um, my, personally, my favorite track I've written is actually Captain Haunt in this Halloween DLC event. Um, it's a free DLC event. They usually open it up in like October around Halloween, and then they usually shut it down. But the, and it also, the, it's on Spotify and stuff like that too. But it's the Captain Haunt Phase 2 thing, because it was just like, it was, it was an opportunity. It was like a Vede Benassi meets, uh, oh shoot, what was it? Um, uh, Sebastian, if anyone knows Sebastian as a French producer, like uh, Sebastien, uh, T-I-E-N. Um, Everyone, go look that up if you're into like any like French house at all or anything like that. This guy is just amazing. Um, uh, Sebastian, Benny Benassi, um, ah shoot, I'm forgetting now. But like, and it goes on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, uh, everyone, thank you for coming.
Uh, honestly, this is way more people than I, I totally expected. Uh, you know, I start talking about data systems and stuff, I just figure like, you know, but, you know, I'll give her one nice nap. But uh, you guys were wonderful. Thank you.